You can turn in your King James Bible to the book of Proverbs, chapter 22. I want to talk to you today about the fact that American slavery never ended. And you can say this for a lot of different countries. A lot of countries are practicing a modern day form of slavery. And this will be a very deep study. I'm going to tell you that right now. But uh, I'm going to focus on America because I'm an American. Um, I've been, my ancestors came here in 1720. We've been here for a long time. We're an old American family, all right? So I speak primarily to Americans, but you can apply a lot of what I say to other countries as well, because there's a, the system of slavery is also in other countries, but not quite on the level of America. And there's a reason for that, and I will get into that in this study. You need to follow along in the King James Bible. It's very important that you use a King James Bible. I've said it many times. This ministry is called King James Video Ministries. Um, the King James Version of the Bible is not just a preference for me. It's not something I like because of whatever. There's manuscript evidence that underlies this King James Bible. The vast majority of extant, in other words, ones that we can go and see in museums and things, extant Greek manuscripts, over 99%, line up with the text that underlies this King James Bible. The new versions come from a very small minority, less than 1% of extant Greek manuscripts that are primarily held by the Vatican. Right, it's very important to understand this. This is not the same Bible as the New, Amer New American Standard Bible or the NIV or the ESV or the New King James Version or whatever else. It isn't. There's a reason God's hand of blessing is upon this King James Bible. And uh, this is my authority. Okay? If you're going to prove me wrong, it's not your opinions that will do it. It's the Scriptures. Convince me from the Scriptures. Show me from the Scriptures that I'm wrong. All right? Proverbs chapter 22, verse 7. Let's begin reading here in this study. The rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. Now, I just gave away the whole sermon right there. Before we get into the really good doctrinal stuff here, uh, some really shocking things, details in this sermon that we're going to go over, um, you need to understand a basic concept here. And that is that the rich ruleth over the poor. You know what rich people like? They like to be rich. You know, don't you always hate it when you get a dictionary and you, you know, I want to look up the, the word, um, some word, and and it says, uh, you know, uh, think of a word here, um, wealthy. You look up the word wealthy, and it says one who has wealth. <laughs> you think that doesn't help? You know, I hate it when that happens. But uh, I'm being a little bit sarcastic here. Rich people like riches. Why? Um, because it puts them apart from the average person. It gives them a special feeling. I'm wealthy. I'm rich. I'm increased with goods and have need of nothing. If you know the story in the New Testament. It helps them to feel like they're in a better place. I don't live in that uh, bad part of town. I live in a very nice house. I don't live in these small little shacks and trailers and things out there. And I dress with very fancy clothes and I wear only the finest jewelry. And my Shoes are Italian handmade shoes and they're $1,200 a piece. I'm sure you couldn't afford them. And I wear an Armani suit and I drive a Ferrari on the weekend. You see? And here's the point. In order for them to keep that lifestyle, not everybody can be on their level. That's why they have to rule over the poor. You see? Since the very beginning of time, rich people had manservants and maidservants, male and female servants. You have to keep people down and suppressed if you want to main, maintain your lavish lifestyle of wealth and riches. That's why the Bible says here, absolute truth in the word of God, the rich ruleth over the poor. You have to be treated like a animal by the wealthy, the upper class. The elites, the global elites that you hear so much about, you know, people say they don't do this and they want us to go through this and they, they're talking about the they, the rich. <laughs> That's what they're talking about. And it says here, and the borrower is servant to the lender. So the Bible gives you the exact formula right there that has been carried out for thousands of years. The rich have to rule over the poor. And how do they rule? By lending you money. Hmm, very interesting. 
Of course, that doesn't go on anymore. This is just, you know, this Bible is such an archaic book. I mean, it's so hard to understand this Our archaic Elizabethan English, you know, and everything. It, it just, I can't relate to the Bible. Well, then you're very ignorant of how things work. When you get yourself into lots of debt, and I'll talk at the end about how to get out of debt, you get yourself into lots of debt, you're a slave. You are a slave to the banking system, the rich people. And I don't mean that you go in there and the tellers that work behind the counter, they're not rich. They're just employees of the actual banking cartels that are running it the, through the central banks. And then you get into the International Monetary Fund and then you get to the Bank of International Settlements and a lot of these big people, the rich, you know, and they want everybody to be in debt. That's why they're scared of unbanked people. If you have money outside of their system, that frightens them. That scares them very much because then you don't need their money. You see, debt freedom is true freedom. Let's go back to the book of Leviticus. I have lived debt free for many years. You say, wow, you must be really rich. Actually, no, I'm, I'm not very rich. I'm actually uh, not real high income. But uh, you can live without being in debt. You have to make sacrifices. And I'll talk about that later on. But uh, I lay down at night and I don't have to think about how am I going to pay my bills. I don't have to think about my mortgage or my car payment or my whatever other debt based payments. I'm not a servant to any lender. This house that I'm standing in here uh, was paid for completely with cash. Um, I didn't have to go and get any kind of thing from the bank and whatever else. And I'm not looking down on you if you're in debt. I'm not at all. But you need to get out of that debt because then you'll have true freedom. And we'll talk about that. Um, Leviticus chapter 25 Verse 39, this is some very interesting things here. And um, I was going a totally different way with this study. And the Lord, I was looking up some words to do a word study. And the Lord led me to this passage. And I started reading down through and I thought, wow. Um, I mean, here we are in America with uh, nearly $32 trillion in debt. Um, you can go to nationaldebtclock.org or something, I think it is. And you can see the debt. It's just the numbers are just constantly going up. Americans can't stop spending. And, and what, did they, what did they just do there? Well, I guess they didn't totally officially do it here. It's June what 3rd, I think. Um, but they're saying that they raised the debt ceiling again. So now they can borrow more money, you know, more debt, which means more slavery, more bondage, more servitude for, you know, everybody really. Because inflation is going to go up. And inflation, if you don't know, is a hidden tax. All right? We're not going to raise taxes. We're just going to print more money so that you, the cost of goods goes up and you'll have to spend more money. Uh, well, who am I paying this money to? Well, to the government? Well, you know, well, to the Federal Reserve Bank, which is not government. If you don't understand that issue, you probably should look into that too. It's a private, run-for-profit corporation. It's incorporated. Okay? Government's not incorporated. All right? But uh, we have to pay that back. Well, that's a tax. Yes. Uh, Leviticus chapter 25, beginning in verse 39. And if thy brother that dwelleth by thee be waxen poor and be sold unto thee, thou shalt not compel him to serve as a bondservant, but as an hired servant and as a sojourner, he shall be with thee and shall serve thee unto the year of Jubilee. Okay, I'll keep reading here a little bit. Then shall he depart from thee, both he and his children with him, and shall return unto his own family, and unto the possession of his fathers shall he return. For they are my servants, which I brought forth out of the land of Egypt. They shall not be sold as bondmen. Thou shalt not rule over him with rigor, but shalt fear thy God. All right, um, we'll stop there for a minute. Okay, what's going on here? Some guy's fallen onto some hard times financially for whatever reason. All right. Uh, they didn't have insurance policies back then. So if you had a bad storm come through, you could have your crops wiped out or your animals, your livestock wiped out. You could have your home have a fire or anything else. There's a number of reasons. You make a bunch of bad financial decisions and you be waxing poor. Okay. What's that talking about? It's just meaning there's a lot of poverty. Things are getting worse and worse with you. And they would actually have to come and say, 
um, I need to pay off my debts. So I don't want to go to, I don't, it's not I'm going to go to a debtor prison. No, I'm actually just going to become a debtor to a wealthier man in the area. The rich ruling over the poor, you see. And so I'm going to come and I'm going to work for you. And the Lord is saying here in the Torah, the, the law that Moses gives to the children of Israel, and he says to them, okay, if one of your brethren comes to you and says, I'm waxing poor, things are really bad for me, I need you know, to pay off my debts here, I have a lot of money that I need to make, you don't bring them in and say, okay, I own you now. No, you're just a hired servant for me. I hire you and you work for me until your debts are paid. And then in the year of Jubilee, which I think is every 50 years, the year of Jubilee comes around and then you get to go back to the possession that was there, your inherited land and things from your forefathers, right? That's how that works. But there's a different situation here when you're dealing with heathen. See, we're talking about Jews handling Jews, the nation of Israel handling each other. Don't make them a bond servant. But what happens when you have a Jew dealing with a Gentile? Hmm. Here's where it gets interesting. Verse 44. Both thy bondmen and thy bondmaids, which thou shalt have, shall be of the heathen that are round about you. Of them shall ye buy bondmen and bondmaids. Huh. So if you want actual servants, then you go out and you get them of the heathen. And you say, you are my property now. They don't even have the rights of, a, of normal people. They're now your bondmen and bondmaids. Let's continue reading. And by the way, it doesn't say black people either. Okay, understand that there were Japhetic people as well. Japheth, there are three basic kindreds of people in the Bible. Japheth, Ham, and Shem, the three sons of Noah. Japheth is the father of the white races, the Europeans. Shem is the father of the native, or the uh, Indian and the Jew and the Orientals. And Ham is the father of the Africans and India as well. So their descendants, so you can go back to saying, you know, well, Hamites or Japhethites or Shemitic people or Shemites, things like that, according to the Bible. That's what I'm telling you there. But it doesn't say only the Hamites, only the black Africans are supposed to be slaves to the Jews there. No, it just says heathen. That would include my ancestors. I'm a uh, you know, northern uh, Germanic slash uh, also from Britannia as well, Scottish and German. Um, Grand, my maternal grandmother was Scottish of the Campbell clan, and my um, maternal grandfather, he was uh, from uh, Germany, and then both my grandparents on my father's side are German as well. And, you know, most of my ancestry is from Germany or, uh, you know, uh, Scotland and things like that. So just to put that in there. So I would have been included in this that the Jews could have bought my ancestors and used them as slaves. Just to get that out there. Um, verse 46, And ye shall take them as an inheritance for your children after you, to inherit, inherit them, them for a possession. They shall be your bondmen forever. But over your brethren, the children of Israel, ye shall not rule over uh, one over another with rigor. Hmm. They shall be your bondmen forever. To inherit them for a possession, they shall be your bondmen forever. You say, what are you doing with the forever thing? Okay. Um, if you're with somebody forever, wouldn't that be another way of saying till death do us part? Um, you know what that is? Let me just write something out here. That's called a... Uh, Mortgage. You say, what are you talking about? Mort, from the word for mortal, basically, and then the gauge there. Mortgage means a death pledge. Look up the etymology of the word mortgage. I'm not joking. Um, and here's how this works. You go and you get a 30-year mortgage or a whatever type of mortgage. And what do you do? The bank says, okay, here's the stipulations of the mortgage. And if, you, if this seems acceptable to you, then I want you to sign here. You go like this, and you sign your name right there. It's, 
not going to show you my signature. Doesn't matter. You say here's the date, you know, July or June the 3rd, 2023, like that. And the bank signs down here like this. And they say, yeah, 632023. But here's the interesting thing this mortgage note then is turned into something called, let me write it out here, a mortgaged backed security. Why? This note here, basically this mortgage note that you, I mean, it's a yellow piece of paper. I get it's not the official thing. I don't have a mortgage, but stick with me here. When you sign this at the bank, the bank doesn't just say, oh, nice, we'll put this in the filing cabinet right here, and when you get it paid off, we'll just kind of take it out and rip it up. No, no. The bank now takes your signature on that mortgage note, and they put it out into the stock market. It's now an investment, in other words, essentially. Now they can go and they can trade that, and they can exchange it for money and other things. I'm not joking. Study it. The mortgage-backed security issue. You have now become, as the Bible says, a surety for a stranger. And the Bible goes on to say that you'll smart for that. In other words, you'll be hurt by that. Hmm. They that will be rich fall into the temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. 1 Timothy chapter 6. I wonder if there's any connection there. But I'm not joking. This is reality. You are not, your mortgage that you have with your local bank or whatever borrowing institution, um, it's not there in the bank. They took that and now you saying, I'm going to pay back whatever the amount is. You know, let's just say that the amount is uh, $150,000. Draw that right there, $150,000 right here. They're saying, hey, um, Brian Denlinger is good for $150,000. He promised us, here's his signature, there's the date, there's our signature, there's the date. He promised that he's going to pay this back. So we've just created wealth based on a slave, a bond servant. He's a possession of the bank. You see, you know what good people, you know what our problem is? Good people, you know, the rich rule over the poor, the poor. Uh, most of us would be falling into that category. Um, good people just want to live their life. Good people just want to go and work hard and be able to have food and enjoy some, themselves and whatever else. That's what good people do. Um, the rich, uh, all these people that want to get rich, uh, the love of money is the root of all evil, the evil people out there, in other words. Um, these rich people, they want to take advantage of you and me. So they create a whole different lexicon of language that they can use and lots of Latin terms and other things and, and all the, you know, the, what's a mortgage? Oh, a mortgage is a wonderful thing. No, it's a death pledge. <laughs> they, but they can't call it a death pledge. They just say a, um, a mortgage. Yes. You know, let's come in here and you can get a mortgage. Come, you know, imagine if they were honest, uh, come on into the bank here where we steal your money and you deposit money and we take it while you're not looking and we spend it on what we want it to be spent on called fractional reserve banking. Come on in here and we want to sign you up for a death pledge so that you can basically be our bond servant. And it's weird because, you know, you get somebody and they in the military and they say, oh, that guy, yeah, he was in the military most of his life. He's a 30-year man. 30-year mortgage. 30 years in the military. There's probably no connection to it. I get, I get conspiratorial at times. You'll have to forgive me. <laughs> But uh, this uh, whole thing of mortgages, um, when did mortgages get started in terms of in the housing situation? I'm going to put this up on screen. Screen. Freudian slip there. Scream <laughs> instead of screen. Let's look here. Mortgages finally entered the U.S. housing market in the early 1930s. Great Depression. Insurance companies, not financial institutions, implemented the idea as a way to take advantage of borrowers during the Great Depression. If a borrower failed to keep up with their payments, they would gain ownership of the property. And that's AmericanFinancing.net, uh, the history of mortgage lending, not Wikipedia or something like that. 
Hmm. Are you beginning to see what uh, slavery is? Funny, because the Emancipation Proclamation uh, of Abraham Lincoln there that he came out with and the whole thing with the Civil War and all this stuff to abolish slavery and everything, that was what, 1865 or something, I think, is when that ended. And here you have 1930, a generation or two later, and 1930 comes along, and in a time of financial collapse, they come out and they say, huh, these people are waxing poor. Here's a mortgage. How would you like to have a death pledge? We'll get you back in a house. All you have to do is just come and sell yourself to us. Did slavery end? Or did it just change? Hmm. You know why people don't uh, fight against the tyranny here in America? I wish I could do something, but brother, I have bills to pay. Nothing to it, I'm sure. Verse 47. And if a stranger or, so or sojourner, let me start over. And if a sojourner or stranger wax rich by thee, and thy brother that dwelleth by him wax poor, and sell himself unto the stranger or sojourner by thee, or to the stock of the stranger's family, after that he is sold, he may be redeemed again. One of his brethren may redeem him. Either his uncle or his uncle's son may redeem him, or any that is nigh of kin unto him of his family may redeem him, or if he be able, he may redeem himself. And he shall reckon with him that bought him from the year that he was sold to him unto the year of Jubilee, and the price of his sale shall be according unto the number of years, according to the time of an hired servant shall it be with him. If there be yet many years behind, according unto them, he shall give again the price of his redemption out of the money that he was bought for. And if there remain but few years unto the year of Jubilee, then he shall count with him, and according unto his years shall he give him again the price of his redemption. And as a yearly hired servant shall he be with him, and the other shall not rule with rigor over him in thy sight. And if he be not redeemed in these years, then he shall go out in the year of Jubilee, both he and his children with him. For unto me the children of Israel are servants. They are my servants, whom I brought forth out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So again, if, if you get a, a Jew and he's, he needs money and he goes and he works for a heathen, you know, somebody like one of my ancestors, um, then a Jew, another Jew should come along and say to me, hey, I'll buy him, I'll pay for him, whatever he owes you, I'll pay for that, and then he can pay off me. Now, so it's an interesting thing there. The Lord's saying, you know, you're my servants, so don't, you know, take my place. It's kind of interesting, you know, if you have the book of uh, 1 Samuel, and they say, you know, we want a king like the nations all around us. And what does God say to Samuel? He says, they haven't rejected you. They've rejected me from ruling over them. Hmm. Similar thing going on here. God's saying, um, they're my servants. I purchased them out of the land of Egypt, out of the world. He's calling the Jews out of the world unto himself and saying, you serve me now. You be my servants now. That's why Jesus Christ, when he came, you know, God manifest in the flesh, he comes to the earth and he says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Huh? Take my yoke upon you? You're a servant to the Lord, a bond servant. Hmm. And the Jews said, no, that's okay. But here's the interesting thing. What if you had a Jew in the 20th century, early 20th century, and that Jew rejected the New Testament. And they said that they're going to follow the Old Testament. Would they be doing anything wrong by making white people and black people, Gentiles we'll say, into their bond servants through banking? Not in their sight. Isn't that interesting? You say, uh, well, now come on, now this is getting insulting. This is anti-Semitic. Well, um, there were more than just Jews involved in the early banking years with the John D. Rockefeller and J.P. Morgan and a lot of these other guys, but there were also Rothschilds. Uh, the Red Shield, originally called uh, Meyer Elmshel Bauer. Um, yes, there were Jews involved. Okay? And a lot of the uh, Masonic, Freemasonic people are Jews. 
I'm all for the modern day state of Israel being in that land because they were brought back in unbelief. Okay, it's not some kind of a satanic conspiracy and they're not really truly Jews and whatever, all the anti-Semitic nonsense. But that doesn't mean that I'm for everything that they do. That doesn't mean that I think that the Jews are wonderful people. They are Christ-rejecting, hell-bound sinners is what they are. But I just find it rather interesting that they're actually following what the Old Testament said to do. Let's enslave people. Let's be the rich people that rule over the poor. Let's make the people get into death pledges that they may be our possession forever. And let me ask you a question. People that get mortgages, that get car payments, that have debt, how many of them ever become debt free? My parents, my father, he had a death pledge, a mortgage. And uh, he was, you know, 30 year mortgage. He was out there and he was trying to work hard and everything. And he was, he was a very hard worker. He was an engineer at Ford New Holland, designed farm machinery and uh, worked his way up, had no col college education, started out in the shop, worked his way up to senior engineer through hard work and determination. He was, you know, designing farm machinery, uh, be, you know, right around the time that the early computers were first coming out and um, in the 1960s or, or so. And, uh, you know, so hard worker. I'm not saying any, anything against that, but he had a death pledge. He had a mortgage, multiple mortgages. He got a, they built a house on uh, Peach Lane in Ronks, Pennsylvania, um, the area where I grew up, and built a house. My father, first he bought the land, and then he got uh, a mortgage to build a house, and then he bought land back in behind it, and then he got another mortgage to build that house. That's the, I was three years old when we moved from the first house. And then I was at the other place until I, I guess I was 25 years old um, is when they sold my childhood home there the, where I grew up most of my life and um, had a mortgage. And the reason that he got rid of that is because he was laid off as a senior engineer because the company decided that they were going to take some of the highly paid senior engineers and replace them with lowly paid, lowly paid uh, college students. And that's what they did to my father. He was overqualified, you know, so they got rid of him. And uh, some of the people that, you know, were there and whatever else, I guess, had the right connections, they stayed on. And my father got laid off. It was a, he wasn't really happy about that. Went, to, went from working as a senior engineer at a Ford Motor Corporation to working at a hardware store selling fertilizer, you know, and yard care products. And... Um, I don't think I've ever told that story before, but that's what happened with my father. And when he was leaving, his, the financial advisor there for Ford Motor Corporation, he said to him, now I want to give you some advice. He said, you're never going to find a job. Try to find a job as a senior engineer. You're very qualified. You've done some real good stuff for the company. Try to find a job, but I can tell you pretty much not going to happen because you're overqualified and you're not going to be able to get your high salary again anymore or whatever else. And he said, so here's what you do. Pay off your mortgage. Do you have a mortgage? My father said, yes, I do. He said, pay it off. My father said, well, I'm only a few years away. He said, no, pay it off right now. You want to pay off that mortgage. And that's exactly what my father did. And you said, well, then from then on, once your father was debt free, he stayed out of debt, right? No, they got a newer vehicle later on. My father always had clunkers. You know, he had the, the uh, work car, the, the clunker. You know, that he'd get some old thing. And I remember he had a Chevy Chevette at one point in time. I'll get back to the sermon here in a minute. <laughs> but he had an old Chevy Chevette. Look it up if you don't know what that means. Younger people wouldn't know what that is. But uh, he had this Chevette and the transmission didn't even work correctly. You put it in third gear. And if you left it in third gear for a while, it would, it would come out of gear and go back into second gear. <laughs> Not real good. And so you had to make sure you get into third and then quickly shift into fourth. And then it would stay in fourth gear. Um, but he drove it. He drove it every day. Uh, rust bucket, you know, just a piece of junk, but he kept on driving the thing. He had a Plymouth Horizon that, that uh, it had, you know, the rings were going out, I guess, in the, in the pistons, you know, the piston rings, and, and it would blow all kinds of oil and things. And, and he, he thought that was funny, you know, and he'd, he'd let it uh, kind of load up a little bit, and then he'd hit the gas really hard, and it would just puff all this blue smoke out, and he called it his smoke screen, you know. But that's what he did. We had one good car and one beater car. 
one clunker that he would buy for a couple hundred dollars and he would drive the thing till it died every day to work, drive back and forth. Uh, he used to ride motorcycle, a uh, little Honda CB350, I think it was. And uh, he dr drove that thing year round, rain, snow, dry, sunny, you know, he would ride that thing all the time. Why? Had a mortgage. He was a bond servant for most of his married life. And then afterwards, he didn't say, hey, I'm debt free now, never going back into debt again. He went back into debt. Um, I mean, leave your comments down below. Tell me, have you met many people that were debtors all their life and then they just stopped and they said, I'm done now. I'm not going to be in debt again. I don't know. Uh, maybe there are some out there. But uh, as for me and my house, uh, we will serve the Lord debt free. I don't want to be in debt. I like to be free. Now let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 23. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. If you're newly saved, you might not know where that's at. Just a few books over, heading towards the New Testament. Deuteronomy chapter 23. Deuteronomy 23, verse 19 and 20. Thou shalt not lend upon usury to thy brother, usury of money, usury of victuals, usury of anything that is lent upon usury. Uh, to a stranger thou mayest lend upon usury. Hmm. But unto thy brother thou shalt not lend upon usury, that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all that thou settest thine hand to, to in the land, whither thou goest to possess it. He said, what is usury? Very simple. It's called interest in our modern vernacular. All right. Um, I'm going to lend you the money to buy this house, but you're going to pay me back whatever the interest rate is currently. Okay. Uh, right now, the interest rate is continuing to go up and it's going to continue to go up. I heard recently that the IMF told the Federal Reserve, Jerome Powell, the head of the Federal Reserve here in June of 2023, um, they said, you need to raise interest rates. And all the banking and all the, you know, a lot of the financial advisor people out there are saying, the Federal Reserve's done raising interest rates. No, they're not. I would be absolutely shocked if they lower interest rates uh, again here anytime soon uh, because they're supposed to be trying to bring down inflation. The whole thing is a scam, brethren. Okay, please understand this. In the Bible, they had gold and silver for coinage. And if you get really poor, then you have copper and things like that. But there has to be... A, I'm just going to go way out on a limb here, okay? I believe any new currency that shows up has to at least start as being gold-backed because of God's word affixing value to gold. And I might do a video on this eventually or something, but this Dave Ramsey liar, new version, uh, false professing Christian, he comes out and he says, gold is just a yellow rock. That's all it is. And I'm thinking, whoa, boy, I mean, that's a... This is kindergarten stuff as a Christian. Gold has value according to the scriptures. I mean, you get to the judgment seat of Christ and the Lord's giving his saints gold, you know, silver and precious stones. Um, you know, Dave Ramsey, if he was saved, he'd get there and say, oh, that's just a yellow rock. I want some treasury bonds, please. <laughs> Money market account. Uh, huh? No, gold has value. And if you're going to bring out any currency, I don't care if you're the most atheistic communist Chinese regime out there, doesn't matter. You better do it in gold because if you don't, God won't recognize your country or your power going forward. But I think there's a reason why China is buying uh, huge amounts, tons of physical gold. Hmm. And the Federal Reserve supposedly with Fort Knox had all this physical gold that was there and it's backed. We back all, all the money that we print. It's backed by gold. Uh, no, it isn't. That's a lie. All right. Maybe early on they would, you know, maybe had a little bit of gold there to kind of make it look that way. But uh, if you look at an old Federal Reserve note, by the way, it's, it used to say that it's redeemable in lawful money at any Federal Reserve bank. Hmm. And then they took that off of there later on. It's just legal currency. It's, you know, legal tender for all debts, both public and private. Uh, and again, you, you know, Brother Brian, the, the economics doesn't matter. Money doesn't matter. Who cares? What? Oh, you don't understand the whole situation. There's a spiritual tie-in with money, right? And if you get into a situation where you are in debt, 
you're a bondservant to somebody. The rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. You are a slave. And Jesus Christ came to set us free from slavery, free from bondage. And you better get a hold of that, because if you are a servant, then you're always going to be a coward in certain areas because you have your bills to pay. It's very important. The study is extremely important. I'm trying to free the slaves. You see? And yes, I have been in debt, by the way, in my past. Way back many years ago, I had debts to pay. So I do understand what it's like to have a monthly payment and everything else and to go through the bank and all that stuff and sitting there and yeah, fill this out and fill that out. And we're going to have to check your income and do that. I've been through all that stuff. So please understand that. But usury is interest. And the Bible's saying, again, you're not supposed to charge usury. Don't make your brother, you know, your Israelite brother or whatever, your Jewish brother, don't make them your bond servant and don't charge them usury. If they need money, give them the money and say, okay, I lent you $20, give me $20 back when you can, all right? But to the heathen, here's $20, and depending on how long it takes you, you have to pay me more than $20 back. I heard recently there was, a, I forget the statistic, but there was a, a guy that was an investment guy or whatever, realtor investment, you know, real estate broker type of a guy, I was listening to and he said he gave a certain amount and I forget what it was I think it was two hundred thousand dollars in that range and he said if you go the full length of that mortgage the 30-year mortgage he said you basically would be tripling that amount you know so in other words you would be paying six hundred thousand instead of two hundred thousand so the bank says oh here's a two hundred thousand dollar house you want this here you go now you pay us back a total of six hundred thousand dollars over the course of thirty years, and then they're you know the the uh, FHA I think it is, um, you know now said that it's okay to have a forty year mortgages in some, in some cases, where you're having this the interest the usury is even that much greater because you're extending it out another ten years, so I want to have the lowest payment possible. Okay, then you're going to be paying more usury. See, this is why God's saying in his word, God never tells you, hey, get into debt. Go on in there and get, you know, if you don't have the money for what you want, then go borrow it from some wicked devil that wants to make you their slave all your, for the rest of your life. It's very important to understand that. Let's go to the New Testament now. Romans chapter 13. There is freedom. You can get out of debt. It's hard. It's difficult. I've done it myself. I'm going to talk about, about some solutions here as we continue. Romans chapter 13, verse 7 through 8. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. All right. Uh, owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Now you'll get some of these wicked false prophets and they come out and they say, well, when it says owe no man anything, that's just saying in the ideal situation because nobody can live without debt. And that's not what the text is saying. Well, owe no man anything in the sense of um, uh, what? You know, No, it's talking about being in debt. Verse 7 is talking about paying taxes, render therefore to all their dues. Hey, there's a police officer that's out there patrolling the streets. Somebody's, you know, some guy gets crazy and goes off on drugs and he's, you know, hacked up his relatives with a machete and he's running down the street. Uh, you know, who, who are you going to call for that? You know, the, the people or something? Call the neighbor next door and say, hey, go take care of it? No, you want a guy that's trained in the law that can go and take care of that situation. Um, there's a bunch of crazy people flying up and down the road going 50 miles an hour over the posted speed limit, you know, endangering their own lives and the lives of children and whatever else. Who do, you, who do you call? You call the police. Some guy's trying to break in your house and whatever else. The police, there's a purpose for them. In Romans chapter 13, verses 1 down through um, verse 6 there, uh, it's talking about the ministers of God, that they're there to punish the evildoers. The government is supposed to be that way. 
Uh, they don't always do that job very well. They start to become a terror to the good and not to the evil, which is what's going on right now. We have a very evil, tyrannical regime in right now. And it didn't start with Biden either. Okay, the government in America has been uh, very much educated by the Jesuits and their counter-reformation trying to destroy the Protestant movement. And uh, they're waging warfare against their own people right now, or against the people of America. They're not their own, because Jesuits are international globalists. Okay, understand that. And, you know, all you have to do is just, if you don't want to believe me, look up any government official and look if they were trained by Jesuits. And you'll see a lot of them were, or given, you know, awards by Jesuits or whatever else. The Jesuits, the purpose of the Jesuit order is for the counter-reformation. People protested the tyrannical control of Rome back centuries ago, and the Jesuits in the 16th century said, we'll undo this. It's going to take us a few hundred years, but we'll undo this and get us back under that Roman control. Understand what the Bible teaches. I have to say a lot of deep things in this study today. The Bible teaches that there are five kingdoms in the book of Daniel. The fifth kingdom, the fourth kingdom, I'll say it this way, is the iron legions of Rome. The fifth kingdom is part iron, part miry clay. So there's a mixture of flesh, man is made of the same chemicals as clay, chemical elements, I should say, as clay. So you have man, the flesh, and Rome, the iron, the Roman Catholic system. Catholic means universal in the Greek philosophy as a philosophical term. That's where Catholicism comes from. It just means the universal, a universal system. So you have the Catholic Church. It's a universal church. Roman, the iron, Catholic would be your clay, the universal. It applies to everybody. All nations are required to become Catholic. If you look at the actual Catholic doctrines and the church, see how that works. All right. So the Roman Catholic church is the fifth kingdom. The people protested because Rome went too far with their evil and their tyranny. And so you had men like Martin Luther, William Tyndale, John Knox, you know, John Huss, a lot of these different guys, John Wycliffe earlier than most of them, they're all coming out and they're saying, hey, this is, you're going too far here to the Roman Catholic hierarchy, the Pope, in other words. And so that system there, uh, people protested against the Roman Catholic system and the Jesuits said, we'll eventually get them back under it again, which is where we're heading very rapidly. Um, that's why you have to be very careful about the Roman Catholic system. All right, Psalm 15, verse 5, let's go there. Owe no man anything, it says in Romans chapter 13, verse 8. And I have, I've read things from different people, and they, they try to get around that. And well, you know, it's not really possible to live that free. And we all have to have some debt. You know, if we're going to build our church buildings, we have to have at least some debt because it costs millions of dollars to build one that's a, any decent size. And they come up with all these excuses about, I mean, it's, it's so plain. Owe no man anything. Oh, but let's find a way that we can loophole this and kind of get around it this way and that way. Or you can just take the text as it stands. Psalm 15, verse 5. He that putteth not out his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent, he that doeth these things shall never be moved. All right? In other words, when the Bible says never be moved or shall not be moved, it's talking about I'm going to stand in my position here and I'm going to prosper and be blessed. See, one of the most deceitful, crooked ways that you can get ahead in life is to pull this Robert Kiyosaki stuff where you say, I'm going to create wealth through perpetual debt. I'm going to become a surety for strangers. And, you know, like I said, the Bible talks about that you'll smart for that. You will be punished for that. You pierce yourself through with many sorrows. And all these guys, you get Donald Trump, Robert Kiyosaki, just failed marriages, failed relationships, uh, Bill Gates, and he's, you know, failed marriage. Why? They're all about money. They put money before their relationships. The love of money is the root of all evil. You see how everything ties together? I mean, it's just, it's just amazing when you actually understand what's going on in the world and you compare it to the King James Bible. And you see, wow, it's right there. The warnings of Scripture. But it says, He that putteth not out his money to usury. If you have money and you can lend it to people, Oh, what should I pay you back here? Is there an interest rate? No, no, no. I know that you're hurting right now. There's, you're waxing poor. You see? You're not going to be my slave. I don't want you to be my slave. I want you to prosper. 
If you're a righteous man, I want you to prosper. Hey, you need some money and I have it that I could lend. Here you go. Pay me back when you can. Make sure that you're lending to the right people. Okay, if it's some bum or whatever, like the American government, that's just going to keep getting into more debt, well, don't give them any money. But if you can see a brother or sister that's truly in need, don't try to rule over them. Don't lend out money with to usury. I need some interest on this. No. Uh, nor taketh reward against the innocent. Hey, uh, you know what? I found out that there's this, I mean, you want to talk about some stocks going up here? Just wait till you see what prosper, you know, we can scam and scheme and whatever else and take people's things from them. No, it's not supposed to be that way. God will prosper you if you do right. If you live a righteous life, God will bless you. If you are debt free, God will bless you. I mean, think about, just think for a second here. What is somebody that's debt free? Somebody that has patience and they can wait for earning the money for what they want to buy. What is somebody who gets into debt? Somebody who's impatient that says, I have to have it right now. That's what it is. Well, you know, see, if you're a sinner, if you're wicked, you're sitting there right now trying to think of how to work your way out of this system, how to justify your life of debt. That's what you're doing right now. I've preached to sinners for years. I know how your minds think. I know exactly how it thinks. Well, what if, oh, and you come up with this thing, this, this thing that it doesn't even relate to your life, but you see, you need to come up with that little hypothetical situation so that you can say then, well, see, if it's okay for that person to be in this situation, then my debts aren't too bad after all, I guess. <laughs> Or you can just take my rebuke and understand that I love you enough to tell you the truth. And I love you enough to warn you. You see? You could do that. You could, you know, maybe think your way through that one. I'd like to see everybody out of debt. So, turn to John chapter 8. Now I'm going to talk to you about how to get out of debt. I'm going to give you real financial advice. Can you do that? You're not qualified. I'm qualified to give it to you as long as it's in line with this book. Because this book's been around a lot longer than me. And it's going to be around a lot longer than you. Or me. It's going to outlive all of us. It's God's perfect, pure word. So I'm going to give you some uh, financial advice that lines up with this book. And it'll work every single time. How do you start going debt free? What's the first step that you need to take? John chapter 8 Verse 31, then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Do you have to know the truth in order to be debt free? Yes. You say, well, it's free in the sense of from the, the bondage of sin and from going to hell when you die. Yeah, that's there. But it also relates to other things. We're not supposed to be in bondage to other men. Let's continue reading. Verse 33. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and we're never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Now think about the statement that they just made there. It just shows you how bad these men were, these wicked men were. We be Abraham's seed, and we're never in bondage to any man. Oh, really? <laughs> uh, were Abraham's seed, were they in bondage to the Egyptians? For 400 years? Yeah. Uh, they just lied to Jesus. You don't want to lie to God manifest in the flesh, okay? <laughs> uh, we're Abraham's seed. We're descendants of Abraham. We were never in bondage to any man. Uh, what was Egypt about then? Down there, 400 years, bond servants to Pharaoh. The Lord had to bring you out. Not too bright. Uh, people that lie to God right to his face and talk back to God, uh, they're the dumbest people out there. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Verse 34, Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. All right. What's the first step in becoming debt-free? Can you become debt-free and live a good life without Jesus Christ in your life? 
You say, well, I think I can. Well, I would disagree with you. Um, you need to be saved. You need to understand that you have to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not that you come to my church and you have Pastor Appreciation Day and you give Brother Brian a really good gift because he's a great pastor and he gets 10% of my income. <laughs> no, no. There's no 10% of your income in this book here in the New Testament that, you have, that you're required to give or whatever else. Okay, There's no required New Testament tithe of 10% to keep a church building going. In fact, there's no church buildings in the New Testament. If you just go and you read the King James Bible and read it for yourself with an open mind away from all the preconceived notions of organized religion, you realize, wait a second, what these church buildings are doing, it's not based on the scriptures. Hmm. If this is God's book, and that's the teachings of men out there, I don't think I'm going to be in tro trouble for following God's word. Bing, light bulb goes off. Huh. Wait a second. You mean to tell me I could actually work for a living, and it's up to me to give to a ministry that I want to give to? And I'm not required to give 10% of my income to my local church? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm telling you. That's why you have to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, not with some preacher someplace. You see how it starts? Have a right relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. If the Son shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. It starts there. Okay? So you get down on your knees and you say, Okay, I believe this book. You go through the gospel. You say, Jesus Christ died according to this book. I want to be made free. If ye are my disciples, continue in my word. Hmm. I showed you a lot of times between the modern world and this old, archaic King James Bible. Amazing, miraculous tie-ins with this book. You say, I believe this book. This book says that Jesus died for my sins. Wow. I can't work my way to heaven. He died on the cross. Horrible, painful, terrible death to pay for my sins. And because he died and that was it for him, then I guess I can be saved through that. Uh, no, actually, it's uh, he died, he was buried, and he rose again the third day, according to to the scriptures. Huh. And uh, the Bible says if you believe that by faith, you can't see it, so you have to believe by faith. You say, I trust this book. I trust it completely. And I believe that what it says about Jesus dying on the cross, that that's enough to pay for my sins. I believe that. And the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You get down on your knees and you say, Lord, God, I believe your word. I believe that that book says Jesus died for my sins. He was buried and he rose again. He's up there. You're Jesus, God. I know that. I want to be saved. I want to go to heaven when I die. God, could you please save me? I've messed up my life terribly. Lord, I'm in debt. You know, there's more than just financial debt. There's also sin debt scars, health issues. Why? Because the wages of sin in the past is death. Do you realize that? Well, I smoked cigarettes for years. <coughs> I can barely breathe now. <coughs> Must be genetic. <coughs> no. You caused your sin. You caused that emphysema or whatever else, you're getting some lung cancer or whatever. Maybe you better get out of debt, sin debt. Um, have some cirrhosis of the liver and things. Yeah, drinking and partying all those years. Yeah, see, I'd scar on my face right there. Well, I'm here and I got, had to have surgery back in here and things. Yeah, I was in a bad car accident the one time I was out partying and I got a little bit drunk that one night. And Debt, sin debt. There's one that'll pay it off. He already did. All you have to do is just come and ask him. God, please forgive me. I don't even know what all salvation means, but hey, I need a new life. I want to be debt free. Hmm. Being debt free. It starts. Now, God saves you. And now you say, okay, Lord, I have a bunch of debts. 
And the Lord says, okay. Having food and raiment, let us be there with content. That was a good meal. Got some clothes on my back here. Um, you know what? I think going to the big stores anymore and getting myself into lots of credit card debt so I can have latest fashions, I think I better just uh, swallow my pride and just go down to the local uh, Salvation Army, Goodwill store, whatever, uh, used clothing store, and um, see what's down there. You'd be shocked sometimes. I mean, there's some really expensive clothes at those places. I remember I literally went to a, a used clothing store in Caribou, Maine, which is to the north of us, and went in there and I saw this sweater and I thought, that sweater looks really nice. And I went over, it's Icelandic wool. Beautiful sweater. I said to my wife, come here. She came over, I took it off the mannequin thing and I said, try that on. Tried it on, fit her perfectly. Probably would have cost a couple hundred dollars brand new. Somebody said, oh, it's scratchy or something. And they gave it to the used clothing store. I think we paid, I think, I forget what it was, $15 for it or something. So don't think, oh, I'm going to be dressing in rags, you know, oh, whatever. You can find some really nice clothes at used clothing stores and you save money. Hmm. And what do you do with that saved money? You go out and you spend it on the town. No, you pay down the debt. You say, well, how am I going to pay all down, down all my debts at once? You don't. You don't. Work on one. You have your mandatory payments. I'm not saying don't make payments, but I'm saying start to work down your debts. Get one credit card. Say, I'm going to have this thing paid down. I'm going to work extra hard. You know what? Um, this thing here, this the little game camera thing here. Um, you know what? I'm not even using this thing anymore. You know what? I'm going to put that on eBay. See if I can get some money for this. And if I get that money, uh, I'd be tempted to go out and splurge on something that I don't really need, but I'm going to put it towards paying off that debt. Huh. You know, I have I could have a yard sale. There's a bunch of things I don't need. Let me do that. Pay down the debt. To get your first credit card paid off. Amount owed or whatever else you get the statement. Zero. Call up the credit card company. Please cancel my card. Take that card and cut it up with scissors. Throw it in the trash. You say, well, that sounds kind of radical. It's very radical, actually. It's like I told people in the my pornography epidemic study, and I said, if you're having a hard time, every time you get on, you know, online, you get tempted to go and look at pornography, some website or whatever else, then you might need to just get away from the internet for a while. Get away from the internet? Yeah. Um, you might have to get a little radical, you see. I realize that there are some good uses for a credit card, but if you have a problem, if you have debt, then get away from credit cards. It's the best thing that you can do if you want to be free. You see? Um, well, we have uh, uh, car payments and things like this. Okay, get an older car. Sell that new car that you have, the new vehicle that you have. Get rid of it. Um, go down to one vehicle. I mean, right now we have several vehicles because of just for different purposes and things like that. You know, we have a car that we can go driving farther distances. We have a Jeep that we can take back road areas and whatever else, but I paid cash for all of them. Uh, I have a big old ambulance that I can use to pull trailers with and I can go other across the country with it if I need to. Pay cash. And it was not in good shape. I had to do a lot of work to it to get it to run good. Um, I'm not going to go out there and buy things with debt. I'm just not going to do it. And you get to the point, I mean, it, but when we first moved here to Maine, let me say this, we had one vehicle. And um, I had bought a dual sport motorcycle after about six months, I guess, of being here in Maine. And uh, the one time I remember I went to the post office, this was up in Bridgewater where we used to live. I went up to the post office, which was right up the street from where our house was. And I went to go out, get in my truck, and we had to go shopping, and it wouldn't start. And I thought, oh, great, the starter just went out. And so I literally had to bump start it. Thankfully, I was parked on a little bit of a hill, so I coasted it and put it into gear and let the clutch out, and it started. But you can't do that all the time. So I drove it back down to the house, parked it, and then I got on my motorcycle, and I rode to the auto parts place, got a new starter for my truck, came back, put it on the truck, and it ran fine. But it's a little bit scary having one vehicle. But you know what? You can do it. 
you can do it to pay down those debts. Get something, you know, even if you have some kind of a, a, a big V8 truck or some kind of a fancy sports car or something, lower your pride. Get something that's a four-cylinder, some little cheap economy thing. Oh, what would the guys at work think? Oh, what would they think of me? Who cares? <laughs> you want to be debt-free or don't you? You see, it lines up very much with what the Bible says about your salvation. You're going to be mocked when you get genuinely born again. People are going to laugh at you. Oh, you're Christian. Ha <laughs> ha, look at you, little weak Christian. Oh, whatever, you can say whatever you want about me. I know I'm going to heaven when I die. Oh, look at you. You're driving an old vehicle. Oh, look at you. I'm debt free. You're not. I remember uh, my brother in law, he used to have this little Volkswagen Rabbit, um, late 70s, early 80s, a Volkswagen Rabbit. And he had it all, you know, spray bomb, you know you know, getting spray paint and just sprayed all different colors all over the thing. <laughs> ugly car, terrible, ugly. And he had a little bumper sticker on the back and said, at least mine's paid for. <laughs> so the right attitude. But uh, start to pay down your debts. Credit card. Well, first is get saved. But then secondly, start to pay down your debts. Get rid of your credit cards. They're one of the worst interest rate things out there. Get rid of those. Okay. Cut that stuff out. Start to think of any way that you can save money. Secondhand uh, stores to get your clothing. Don't get fashion designer brands and whatever, although you can find them at those places. Pray about it before you go. God can provide. I've seen it happen many times. Um, that's one thing. Another thing, cut out unnecessary spending like going out to eat. Um, you can actually go into the store and you can get really good like shrimp or lobster or something like that splurge a little bit and you can actually make it at home and you have a better meal than you would get from a restaurant. Uh, you don't know what kind of stuff you're dealing with when you go to a restaurant. So um, cut out the restaurants, certainly cut out Hollywood movies and things like that. Um, unnecessary spending, get rid of anything that you don't need. Get radical for a while. Um, you might want to consider uh, selling your home, go in, get a tiny house. What? A tiny house? Are you kidding me? If it helps you save money. We've been living in a tiny house now for many years and um, just a very small place. Um, what, I think it's less than 600 square feet. And, you know, living in northern Maine, I mean, we heat with firewood. And, uh, I mean, it takes almost nothing to heat the place. So I don't have to spend all year, you know, doing 10 cords of firewood or something just to keep the whole house warm or whatever. It, I can go by with, you know, two cords of firewood, sometimes less, in northern Maine, you know. Think of radical ways to save money, you see. And we're debt-free, and we've also been able to build wealth as well. It's an amazing thing that you can do. You actually start to be able to save money and keep money and invest in you know, wise investments like, you know, precious metals and things. And you can do that. You can invest in uh, things like uh, dried goods that you'll use in the future. Um, years ago, just to tell you a story, um, I bought $1,200 worth of spices. And uh, no joke, I got on eBay and there was some, I think it was Spice Jungle or something like this. And I bought $1,200 worth of spices. They aren't going to go bad if you keep them in a good dry location. And uh, I remember they called me up and they said, um, just before we fulfill your order, we just want to make sure that you didn't push the wrong button or something. And they said, do you just really want this? You know, five pounds of turmeric or something, you know, I think it was one of the things I got and, you know, garlic powder and um, onion flakes and things and stuff that we use all the time in recipes. And I said, yeah, that's, there's no mistake with the order. That's what I ordered. And uh, you know, the funny thing, those same spices today are two or three times more expensive than what I paid for them way back when, a number of years ago. Hmm. See, that's how you start to make money. Learn to invest in the right types of things. People get into precious metals, that's fine, but there's other stuff that you can do as well. You say, well, I really like oatmeal. Okay, well then buy a big 50 pound bag of oatmeal or something like that. Um, I really like, uh, I like to use pencils. You know, like this. Well, are they ever going to go bad? No, if you have space to store pencils and you like to write a lot or something, then buy a big thing of pencils. Buy uh, the, the mechanical pencil type. I don't think I have any here right now in my 
office, but buy the mechanical pencils that you can, you know, push the little thing and the lead comes out Buy the, the little replacement lead. You can bit, get whole tubes of that and you, you buy bigger amounts, you get, save money. And you do that with a lot of different categories and all of a sudden you start to realize, boy, I'm saving a lot of money doing this and I'm actually making more money. And now I have all these things around that can help me. I'm not saying to become some kind of a, you know, pack rat hoarder or something. No, you know, within reason. But if it's something, you know, dish soap is another one that you can do. Uh, get a good natural type of dish soap or something or some kind of a, a natural type of soap that you can use for doing dishes or washing your hair or washing your hands or whatever. They have these little foamer things that you can get at the, the sink. You push, put a little bit of soap in the bottom and fill the rest with water and shake it up. And you push and it comes out the foamy soap. We have that stuff and you can have the soap and it just lasts for pretty much indefinitely. White vinegar, you can do that. You can get that for cleaning things. There's a lot of stuff that you can do that you can buy at the right time and then as the years go by and inflation continues to go up, which it will continue to go up um, here in America, especially because they've raised the debt ceiling, as I said earlier, you see, buy it and inflation in a few years, it's going to be two or three times what you paid for it. That's how you save money. That's how you're making money. And all of a sudden your debts start to go away. We got a letter just the other day from a sister in the Lord. And she said, praise the Lord. She said, we're almost out of debt. Well, praise the Lord. That's wonderful. See, salvation is the Lord saves you. And he says, okay, I've written your name in heaven now. You'll be there when you die. Uh, you're now born again. You're one of my children now. Now I'm going to start to help you to get out of debt both sin debt and actual financial debt. And the Lord can help you if you submit to him and do it his way. All right. So that's going to be it for this study. I really hope that it's been a challenge to you. Um, you know, please don't get frustrated if you still have a lot of debt and things like that. Um, it can take years to get out of a bad situation, but start working on it. And don't, you know, you need to develop that discipline to say, if I get the credit card paid off, I'm not going to celebrate by going out and spending a bunch of money. No. Um, you know, start to live a more frugal life. Get debt free. And then you can actually start to build wealth after that. Uh, take radical steps. Learn. Study on your own. I'm not, <clears throat> I'm not your God or anything that you can come and you can ask me any question and Brother Brian knows everything. I don't know everything. Certainly not. I've learned a lot over the years, but I don't know everything, right? So you have to do some research on your own, do your own uh, due diligence, as they say. So I <clears throat> uh, just wanted to put this study together. I hope it's been a real challenge to you. It's been a really neat one for me. And, um, you know, don't get sidetracked on the Jew, this anti-Jew stuff. Um, there are wicked Jews. That's why the time of Jacob's trouble is coming. The book of Revelation with all the horrible things, uh, that's going to be for the Jews, um, it's not for the body of Christ, okay? Um, the body of Christ does not need to be purified. All right, that's nonsense. False converts need to be purified, but the body of Christ, um, Jesus Christ, his blood cleanses, cleanses us from all sin. I'm already purified. Um, the Lord's sanctifying things out of my life, certainly, but in terms of imputation, his righteousness has been imputed to me. Study that issue if you don't understand that. Um, <clears throat> what we owe God in terms of our sin debt, the Lord took that and said, I'll pay for that on the cross and you get my righteousness. That's a very good deal. Best deal that there is. Um, but it takes time, brethren. Okay. Remember that. Don't get discouraged. It takes time, but start making the right moves. Start to think about what do I use? What are things that I can get and I can stock up on that are only going to go up in price, thereby saving me money. I'll buy bigger quantities now and I can save money later on as a result of that. And uh, don't go into the, the whole usury system and the stock market and the bond market and all this other stuff and I want to make money quick without doing any work and ugh, that's very dangerous to get into that stuff. And um, stock market crash in 1929 and there's another one going to be coming eventually here they keep manipulating things and whatever trying to keep it afloat it will eventually crash and you don't want to get caught in that whole system again avoid why well, do i have debts to pay off so i think i'm going to get into debt to pay off my debts 
yeah, that's an idea. You know, let me go to the bank and see if I can borrow money and work out the system and whatever else. The reason that works for guys like Donald Trump and Robert Kiyosaki is because they have papal connections to the insiders. They can tell them when certain market things are going to change or trends or whatever, and then they know the right time to sell and buy and whatever. Uh, you can't do that as a regular person. And you do that, you will be burned for it. And those guys, you say, well, they're getting away with it. No, they're not because they have miserable lives. They're just, their marriages are failing all the time and they're quite miserable. So that's going to be it for this study. Um, thank you to everybody out there for your support of King James Video Ministries. And uh, hope it's been a blessing to you, this sermon, because it was a real blessing to me looking at that and seeing, wow, in the Old Testament, the Jews are actually told to make bond servants of the heathen and use, you know, charge usury to them. And a lot of the early bankers back in the 1930s were Jews. They're doing what the Old Testament told them to do. Um, but they, if you're a Jew out there, you need the New Testament. You need Jesus Christ. He is God. He is your Messiah. The nation of Israel rejected him. Make sure you don't. That is going to be it. We'll see you in the next study.